Do you have solo economic dependency? That is, if you aren't working, you aren't making money. The Art of Passive Income Podcast is the solution. Discover passive income models so you can enjoy life on your own terms. Let freedom ring. Hey, it's Mark Podolsky, the Land Geek, with your favorite niche real estate website, www.thelandgeek.com. And today's guest is going to help us live our best life. But before we talk to our guest, I'd be remiss if I didn't properly introduce my co-host, the professor, the brain, Scott Todd from scotttodd.net, landmoto.com. If you're not automating your Craigslist, your Facebook postings, postingdomination.com forward slash the land geek, learn anything about anything, investorninjas.com. Scott Todd, how are you? Mark, I'm great. How are you? I'm feeling very insecure right now. <laughs> Very, very secure. Uh, I, I can understand that. I can understand that. Our listeners may not understand that, but I can. Well, you know what? Why don't we give our guests bio and then they'll understand. Our guest today is Rock Thomas, the world's number one whole life success expert. So if you don't know about Rock, he has achieved epic financial success, uh, running several successful businesses and six award-winning Remax franchises. He rock embarked on a quest for personal growth, traveling the world and studying with acclaimed teachers like, oh, I don't know, Tony Robbins, T. Harv Ecker, Deepak Chopra, John Gray. I can go on and on. Stephen Covey, right? Um, he's uh, absorbed sy success systems, life and business strategies, and countless life-changing experiences, which I'm very excited to learn more about. After assimilating all he'd learned and talking with people from all walks of life who were seeking more too, he founded Rock Thomas International to bring the best of the best to the world. His programs blend his extensive knowledge about personal development with cutting edge success formulas designed to produce whole life wealth. Rock Thomas, welcome to the podcast. Well, you know, I, I, I should just record that and listen to it in the morning. It sounds great. It sounds a little bit more than, um, than maybe it is. When you're 57 years old, you can pack a lot into your life. But I am definitely passionately curious about personal development. And they don't teach it in school. So you got to go out and find it yourself through books or podcasts like this and discover what are the things that drive you internally. And that's what excites me is how do people – do the things that they want to do and get themselves to do the things that they can't get themselves to do initially through coaching and mentoring. Yeah, no, I've got a lot of questions. I think the first one is just kind of walk us from this tremendous amount of success into the transition from now what, where I want to go out and help people live their best lives. You know, I grew up on a farm and I was taught some fundamental things that served me. I think a little bit like a, maybe a, an athlete or a military individual. I learned how to be resourceful, learned how to make things happen even when things were difficult. And when you take that into the entrepreneurial world, then you tend to deliver a lot of value. And when you do that, you get to a point where you can't, you know, you can't not be noticed. You show up at work early, you stay late, you do extra work, and then you go on holidays for two weeks and people are like, how come half the things aren't being done? Oh, well, Rock's on holidays or John's on holidays if you're that ind individual. So I got rewarded for that and then I just learned to kind of double down, became very interested in, in solving problems, came across a guy named Tony Robbins about 20 years ago and, and I was like, wow, this guy's got so much energy and passion and drive and he's created so much, what can I learn from that? And that led me on the, the journey of mentorship is modeling people that have the results that you want, not just their external results, but their internal thought processes, what they eat, how they sleep, how they meditate, do they do yoga or not. And then I got excited about sharing that with other people because I got so many great results in my life. I'm like, oh my God, I've got this, this business and I wrote a book and I did all these things I didn't think I could do. If I could do that little farm boy kid from Montreal, Canada, dyslexic, nerdy, pimpled face, skinny, uh, laughed at, bullied. If I could create something more than I thought, then maybe I can help some other people do that too. Wow, Scott Todd. 
Well, I mean, it is amazing how much um, how much you can do when you when you put away your your own self doubts, right? Like, you know, oh, I can't do that, or I wish I could do that. Well, stop wishing and just go do it. And you know, I think the problem is that people, like, I'm guilty of it. We're afraid to fail, right? Like, we are literally afraid of making a mistake. I see it all the time, Mark. You see it too. Like, so we're, we're talking to people about like buying a piece of property. And the property might be like $700 and they're afraid that they're going to lose $700. And I get it. I understand $700. No one wants to lose money, but man, if you just go do it, you may not fail, right? Like you might actually turn that 700 into like $7,000, but you got to do it first and you got to be willing to say, well, okay, if that one doesn't work, well then if these other chuckleheads can do it, why can't I go do it and then figure out what they did and go do it. Yeah, so what I discovered was that the reason people don't take the action primarily is for the basic fears that we have as humans is that we're not enough, and if we're not enough, we're not going to be loved. So people try to avoid anything that will emphasize that or highlight that. So they go, if I go all out and invest on a $700 piece of property and it doesn't work out and my wife finds out, she's going to think I'm dumb or that I'm useless or that I'm not a good business person or my friend's going to notice me being a, a bad decision maker. I'm going to wait, hesitate, whatever, and they make up a story. I don't have time. I'm too busy. It's a BS story. And I say that it's a belief system story that represents an internal belief system. And here's what I offer people is what would it be like if you never failed again? Wouldn't that be cool if you could never fail again? And people nope, go, that's not possible. I go, there's two ways to do it. One is never take action, sit on your couch and do nothing. You won't fail, which is a strategy, unfortunately, too many people use. The other one is to change the meaning of failure. Viktor Frankl wrote in his book, Man's Search for Meaning, that the one thing that we have is choice, choice to choose our attitude. And therefore, I suggest to people that you never fail until you quit. So just don't quit on yourself. Just look for a different lesson. So you win or you lose, replace it with you win or you learn. And as you learn, you progress. And as you progress, you grow. And as you grow, you feel better. So that can say, do the $700. It doesn't work out. You learn something. What did you learn? Journal on that and take that experience with you to the next decision and become a better person. And that keeps people in action a little bit more than the tendency to want to sit on the couch. I love that. I'd love to know what your definition is of whole life wealth. Yeah, it's a great question. And it came down to this is... I grew up uh, very hungry to succeed, to prove to my father basically that I was enough. I wanted to hear him say, oh, he was proud of me. It never happened. He died of cancer when I was uh, around 30. I was almost a millionaire at the time and I took all my money and I took care of him for two years and then he passed to colon cancer and I was broke, in fact, bankrupt and I moved back in with my mom. And at that point in time, I got into real estate and I started to work really, really hard, 12, 14, 16 hours a day again, which I had done before, but as a manual labor. And I amassed a lot of money. I became very successful, six Remax franchises, but I burned myself out and I started to do party drugs and I started to get myself in trouble because I didn't know any better. I was still trying to bury the story of Rock Thomas is not enough. And any way you can do that with distractions and with success and buying toys, et cetera, everybody has a different strategy. And then later on, I came to some enlightenment after doing personal development, meditations in India and different things. I won't go through all of them, but I spent over $2 million on personal development. And I realized that it'll never end. It's not getting to the top of Mount Everest that makes you happy. It's about walking up and becoming a better person in the process, working with other people, enjoying camping at base camp and discovering what that's like. So the whole life millionaire or whole life success is about not giving up your health and not giving up your relationships at the expense of your success, having a belief you can have it all and that you work toward that. So for instance, I have a ritual of meditation and yoga in the morning and that grounds me and centers me and gets me in a better alignment. I'm almost 100% vegan now. 
which gets me much healthier and in the best shape of my life at 57. And I have a focus on passive income. So I help people and myself develop passive income vehicles because when you have passive income, then you can do the stuff that really matters is spend time with family and go to your daughter's recital and work on yourself and go to trainings, seminars, listen to podcasts, go to yoga in the middle of the day, two o'clock on a Tuesday afternoon, because you don't have to work. So it's the belief that you can have it all and then providing the strategies for people to go and make that happen. Yeah, no, I, I love that. And, um, you know, I feel like, and I don't know if you agree with this or not, I feel like self-help gets a bad rap in uh, our culture. And, um, you know, what, why do you think that is? And, and what do you think would be some of the worst advice you see or hear given in your area of expertise? Well, another great point, I'd say the worst advice comes from people that haven't lived the emotional experience. So for instance, I've been divorced a couple of times. I know what it's like to go through that and I could relate to somebody going through it. But if a 26 year old kid was gonna become you know, a coach for divorced couples, I would question their ability to emotionally empathize with the individual and have the wherewithal to actually guide them. So that's the first thing. And I think a lot of everybody's a coach now. Everybody's a life coach. Everybody's, you know, <laughs> podcasters and everybody's, everybody's pontificating their wisdom. And most of them have terrible lives. They really do. 95% of people are freaking broke. Most people are overweight, out of shape and addicted to something, whether it's pills or drugs or recreational drugs. Trust me, I work with tens of thousands of people and most people are totally messed up. I'm sorry to say it, but most people are. And we suffer from a disease called looking good. So people won't tell you that. They'll come out and they'll put on their best picture and they'll Photoshop something and drive out in their car. But if you ever say, hey, could I get a lift with you? And they're like, oh my God, let me just clean my car. And there's crap everywhere because that's how people live their life. So, so you asked me two questions. I think I've answered one of them. <laughs> what was the first part? Yeah, that, so that, that, was a, that was a great answer. And Scott and I are laughing because we see this even in our own industry. Of course. Where, you know, they don't go I mean, to the training. They're like, I'm going to be a coach. And they're like, like, they've never done anything. I call them it's false the, profits. It's the nut, exactly. I mean, it's the nuttiest thing is that you see people that like, they, they don't even – they don't even do what they're trying to teach. Okay. Like they, they are, they're self-confessed bloggers or they, they, uh, they went through someone else's program and then all of a sudden they're, they're like the end all be all, but they didn't, they didn't live in the, in the, they didn't go through the battle. Right. Like you can, you can take advice from people on war, but, I want to go through somebody. I want to learn from somebody that's actually had like shots fired over their head as opposed to just sat in a classroom and said, Oh, I think I can, I think I can learn. I, I think I can regurgitate what I just learned. Well, regurgitation is not experience. Sorry. I agree with you hundred percent. And the same thing happened to me when I went to the first Tony Robbins event, I came back to the office and I was regurgitating and I was a little mini me, Tony Robbins, but it's <laughs> like learning how to play music. The first thing you do is you play somebody else's music until you're so comfortable with it that you can add your own little sprinkles to it and then you lose that and you become yourself. And I really believe that's an evolution over time. I like to believe I've gotten there mostly. I still quote other people and I still learn from other people and put my spin on it. And probably 50% of what I share comes from NLP and Tony Robbins and the rest is sprinkled from other people. But most people, just because they ate the meal, they now think that they can open a restaurant and become the next best restaurateur. It's not true. You just tasted the food. Yeah, no, absolutely. And the first part of that question is, you know, why does self-help in our oh, yeah. culture get such a bad rap? Well, there's two reasons in my opinion. Number one is that whenever you say self-help, it implies that you're broken. And people don't want to be, especially people that are in their ego, they don't want to be reminded. They want to go, look, I'm fine, man. I'm a cool dude. I got things figured out. You want to go like, I need to work on myself. I've got childhood issues. A lot of people don't want to. So they're like, oh yeah, for those people that are broken over there, they go to that self-help, I'm cool. And what they do usually is hide behind success. So there is a CEO, they're a big success and they're important and they have big meetings and they're 
generally bullies in a different playground. So that's the number one reason. The number two is that it requires work. And people don't like to work. <laughs> people want the easy street. So if you're going to dig up some of those skeletons in the closet and you have to be vulnerable and you have to be real and you have to say like, you know, hey, I got a DUI. Am I proud of it? No. But I made a mad decision one day and I hid it for years because I had shame. But now today I've evolved enough that I can put it out there and say, yeah, I made a bad decision. But am I a bad person? No. And a lot of people make that mistake that they go, oh, well, I bankrupt a restaurant. I bought a piece of land for $700 and it didn't work out. I am a bad investor. I'm a bad person. I talk about the power of your identity, the words that follow I am, follow you. You are not a bad person. and You just made an ill-informed decision or you're inexperienced and now you have more experience. So you're a more experienced person. So look at it that way and grow that way and become a better version of yourself. No, I, I, I love what you're saying. And, um, you know, I, I write about in, in Dirt Rich, this, this feeling, this void in my, in, in, that I felt, um, even from a kid, like I was never enough. And so I chased all the things that society would say is conventional success. And I got them and it was just this profound emptiness. It was never enough. And then once I lost all of it um, and my ego drift just got decimated, I came out of it such a better person. My question is, is how can somebody who feels like they're not enough not have to go through the pain and suffering and letting their children down, letting their family down like I did and just get to the good stuff? <laughs> And feel like they're enough without having to, you know, go through these, this, this sort of catharsis. Well, I think that, you know, I've worked with a client where the mother and father told the child all the time, they're the greatest, they're the best, they're the most good looking, they're smart, they're clever, they went to the best schools, they supported them, they went to the sh watch them play soccer. I mean, just like the perfect parents. And this child grew up neurotic that they were gonna disappoint the parents, thinking, what if I'm not enough to be everything they say I am? So there's no perfect way to raise a child, in my opinion. The child is gonna interpret what's happening and we're gonna to continue to interpret what's happening. And from that, we're gonna create an identity or what we think is a way to survive in life. So the best way I've learned is if you want to develop this sense of well-being is you have to develop first relationship with yourself. It's an inner narrative of appreciation. Like you would talk to your dog, maybe, you know, Oh, you're so cute. You're such a good little boy. Like literally talking well, because most people talk so badly to themselves that if they talk to their friends like that, they'd have no friends. So it's an inner narrative conversation about appreciation and love. And remember, and I get this from Gary Vaynerchuk, you won the freaking race. It's about odds of four trillion to one that you were born because all those sperms were trying to get, you know, hatched, hatch the eggs. So there's some reason you're here. And when you start thinking about that and appreciating that, then you can start to go, you know what? I do have worth. And then what you need to do is you need to do things that are a little bit outside your comfort zone. In Rise to Superman, Stephen Kotler talks about 4% outside your comfort zone is an area that allows you to actually process the learning. If I was to take you into a plane and I was going to throw you out of the plane without a parachute and say, I'm going to dive down afterwards and catch you, you'll be okay, you would freak out because you're just so faced with such uncertainty that you can't really translate that into a learning lesson because you go straight into survival. But when we do the processes properly and we get you just 4% outside, I say, hey, why don't you go talk to that person over there and say they've got a nice smile. Could you do that? Yeah, you're not going to die. And you start to become a little more extroverted. So by doing things that are difficult, you actually build your self-esteem. How do you feel good about yourself is by relying on the fact that you'll find a way. So you must exercise. When I work with people, I get them sometimes to brush their teeth with the other hand, put the pants on uh, the, with the other leg first, get in the car from the passenger side. What am I doing? I'm getting their brain to get comfortable with things that are uncomfortable, uncomfortable. 
but safe. And then when the real deal comes up, their nervous system is wired to, oh yeah, I'm used to doing stuff. Yeah, uh, we need a volunteer. Okay, I will. What is it? I don't care. I'm in. And that's how I train people to get into momentum. I love it. Scott Todd. I mean, Mark, it's a lot like when I was learning how to fly a plane, you know, like one of the things that they, they do is they take you up to, uh, let's say, 3,500 feet, and you're up there at 3,500 feet, and then what they do is they teach you how to put the plane into a stall, right? Like, all of a sudden, you're, you're slowing the plane down, you keep slowing it down, 60 miles an hour or 60 knots, you're up in the air, and like, they're like, okay, the plane it feels like it's not even moving, and then they're like, okay, now slowly turn the plane because you slowly learn how to turn the plane without inducing a stall, okay? So you learn and then like how to control the plane. And then what they tell you is, okay, now pull, pull it all the way back, through, pull the throttle all the way back, pull, pull back on the yoke so that the plane slows down even further. And so like you're kind of going up like this. And then when the plane stalls, it's not like a car stalls. It's not like the engine stops. What happens is it loses the ability to create lift and then what happens is the nose drops and they do this over and over and over again so that you know, like when the plane stalls, you immediately push forward to recover from the stall. It's like ingrained in you. And it's amazing because you, you do it so much that it becomes second nature to you. Like the first time you do it or probably the first 10 times you do it, your heart's like banging out of your chest. Beyond that, you just know like, oh, it's not a big deal. Just push forward a little bit. The plane will recover. I can, I can continue on what I'm doing. And sometimes when you're take, like, even when you're taking off, like just a normal takeoff, if you don't get it exactly right, you'll, you'll stall the plane. Like, you know, you'll see the light or you'll hear the horn, the stall horn. What do you do? You don't, you don't die. You just push it forward a little bit. Oh, I went too far. Boom. And you recover the flight. And it's that same thing over and over. It's that same type of behavior. Just get outside your comfort zone, learn how to deal with it. And then all of a sudden your comfort zone is like 10 times bigger because you did it. Yeah, hundred percent. And that's how, you know, what's the, if you get, if you get addicted to learning, you get addicted to stalling and feeling what that's like after a while, your nervous system adjusts. And like you said, you're, you expand your comfort zone. You become a new person. I say you keep on recreating your identity. And people that are living full lives, they are growing all the time. They're looking for ways to grow. And I say you need two things to be really successful in, in life is you need a good work ethic, which means you need to be able to motivate yourself, show up and care and want to and wanna go for things. And you need to be curious. You need to be coachable. You need to be open. You need to see things from a different perspective. We've all seen that picture of the old lady and the young lady on the one picture, depending on what you look at, you see something completely different. There are 360 different perceptions of any one given event, depending on your background, your experience, your heritage, et cetera. Culturally speaking, some people yelling is good. Other people being very quiet is much more appropriate, which is right. Neither is right or wrong. The more open you are, the larger spectrum you have to enjoy your life. I mean, what, what you just said is like, it, it, I, I talk about this all the time because I, I, like I tell my, my family, my kids, I tell this all the time. And it's like, look, we are all going through the same world. We, we all see similar events. Like we could sit, you and I could sit in, the, in a conference room together and watch an event unfold and we would see it in different ways. You would see it your way. I would see it my way. I would hear what my way, you would hear it your way. And we go through the world. It's amazing. We go through the world with similar or shared events, but yet we see the world completely different. It's, it's, it's a lot like, you know, when you look at politics, for example, and, and uh, you, you know, you watch, you watch impeachment hearings or whatever, and you hear like you see the world or you see the answers one way. And then everybody else is like, well, there's an avalanche of, of, of uh, evidence. And other people are like, where's the evidence? I ain't seen nothing. Right. Like, cause you, you were, you're not, we're all kind of going through this planet in our own perspective with our own filters and everything. And it's, it's crazy. And the, right? and the, the funny thing is that we have to resist the temptation to think that the other person is seeing the world the same way we are. Right. So we're like, That's Oh, right. you know what? Donald Trump is blah. And we think everybody must think he's blah. Cause we're looking at it through our filters. 
When I was right. younger, my, my father used to correct my behavior, shall we say, by using his large hands on the side of my head. And it created a ringing in my ear. And even today, if somebody eats an apple loud beside my ear, it triggers something that makes me feel very insecure and, and, and unsafe. Now, that person eating that apple could not possibly know about my programming. They're just innocently eating an apple, and I'm kind of looking at them. What the heck are you doing? Who the hell are you? Are you so that's a, an example of you can't possibly know, but for me, loud eating of apples pisses me off. Does that make sense? Not really. I got to get an apple. Hold on, man. So, so Rock, you're probably not even aware of it, but even through our conversation, you brought up a bunch of different tactics that you use to live your best life. You brought up meditation. You brought up yoga. You brought up journaling. You brought up eating clean, being a vegan. You brought up having passive income to have the time to do all of these things. You brought up mentorship. Are there any other tactics or strategies that you would recommend to somebody listening right now to live their best life? There are so many because it's like looking at a golfer and saying he could hit a golf shot that's 30 yards from the green with 14 different weapons. He's got 14 clubs in his bag. And depending on his creativity, he could do it different ways and get the same result as somebody else or better. So there's many, 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 and we can, we can get into it. But I'll just say the one that I think that people overlook the most is what I call a daily audit. And what you do at the end of the day, what I do at the end of the day, I mean, I have my book and it goes with me everywhere. It's a journal and an agenda and a planner and a goal setting device is I journal at the end of the day and I ask questions because questions direct focus and focus creates meaning. So at the end of the day, if I look at my phone or watch TV and fall asleep with the impeachment hearings on in the background, it's going to create a meaning and an energy for me. However, if I go to bed and I take half an hour quietly and I read a quality book, some good thoughts, and I journal and answer these questions, what did I contribute today? How did I grow? Who did I connect with? When did I laugh? And what did I learn? What am I grateful for? So some of my favorite questions, and you write them out. Something happens when you write something out, it goes into your brain and goes, you know, I am grateful for the fact that I live in Phoenix, Arizona, where it's sunny 300 days of the year and it's beautiful. And I came from Montreal and I actually created the wealth to be here. And all my friends are back in Montreal, many of them that didn't make the shifts I made and they're freezing their butts off at this time of year. God, I'm so grateful that I actually get up early, work hard and do the things that other people aren't willing to do to get the life that I have today. I'm actually a badass. I'm a type of person that can depend on myself and I'm proud of the effort that I put in. I think there was P. Diddy or somebody else that got an award, an Academy Award or something. He goes, I would like to thank myself for getting up early and working really hard. And when everybody said it wouldn't work, I said to myself, I will find a way. I would also like to thank the little kid in me that was curious and hungry. And he went on and on. So this practice of auditing at the end of the day allows you to be in what I call your plan for progress. And when you have a plan for progress, you have a plan for happiness because progress equals happiness for most people. When you have a plan to achieve a goal, you have a plan for frustration, disappointment, anxiety. So I tell people like Deepak Chopra says, you've got to set an intention and then you've got to let it go right? So you, you set that goal to double your business. You set the goal to get the car. And then you wake up every day and you enjoy each day doing the little things that get you there. And at the end of the day, you take a reckoning with yourself and you celebrate and enjoy even the, the things you messed up. And you go, you know, it was a bad day today. It was a really bad day. I, I, I ate that bag of licorice and I knew I shouldn't have. And I, and I had three cups of coffee and now I can't sleep. And God, you didn't behave at your best. Journal, learn, and tomorrow I make some new choices. So that would be the big tool I would give people and say that, you know, Mark, I think that's one of the things that people don't get to, but is it doable? Does it cost any money? No. So it's available for everybody. I love it. Scott Todd, final thoughts? 
Well, I would just have one one final question for you, and that is, what what advice would you give to somebody who seems like they are always self sabotaging themselves? Right? Like, what would you say to somebody that like they they I mean, you've seen it. You've seen the people that it's just like they they have success and then they've got something going good and then they're like purposely blowing it up on themselves. Like, what would you say? Such a great question, Scott. Um, I would say that all suffering comes from less loss or never. When we think that we're going to have less of something, somebody's going to finish the pie and I get no pumpkin pie we feel a suffering, we beat ourselves up. I don't deserve it. They took it from me. I wasn't strong enough to speak up. When we feel like we're gonna lose something, I might lose the job, I might lose the contract. We suffer, we beat ourselves up. And if we think that we're never gonna get married or we're never gonna fall in love or we're never gonna have financial freedom, we suffer. The antidote to all of those things is to serve. Show up and serve, give make a difference in other people's lives. There's very little suffering that happens when you're helping another person because you're focused on helping somebody else, which is innate as a human. So if you do that, you'll find most people when they're doing that, they're not beating themselves up. They're oh, like if if I was to ask you, Scott, if you could help me around something you have experience in, most people tell me that they'd be like, they'd be happy to help. And when you're helping somebody else with your life's experience, then you tend to feel good about yourself because you're now taking something that you built inside yourself and giving to somebody else. And that creates self-esteem. It's when people focus on, I don't have enough. I didn't do it. They weren't fair to me. And they play the victim that their life will suck long-term. Get out there and give. I, I love that. I love that. So, Rock Thomas, your mentorship has been phenomenal. And we're going to ask you for one more tip of the week, a website, a resource, a book, something else actionable for the Art of Passive Income listeners to improve their businesses, improve their lives. What do you got? Well, I have my own podcast called The I Am Movement. So they can go check it out at rockthomas.com forward slash podcast. And they can listen to me talk to thought leaders like yourselves and talk about how the identity that we have for ourselves, the labels that have been suggested by our parents that you're too short, you're too tar, tall, you'll never amount to anything are all just suggestions. And just like a great hypnotist can suggest that somebody act like they're a dog and bark on stage, there's a way to talk to the unconscious mind and then to reprogram that so that those suggestions that aren't serving you can be let go and that you can step into your own personal power. They can go to rockthomas.com and get my free book called The Power of Your Identity, and they can start the processes, the five steps to changing your identity, how I went from pizza face to ruggedly handsome, from working hard to working smart, from being an employee to an entrepreneur and becoming financially free. So those are some of the, the quick resources, Mark. All right, I love it. Scott Todd, what's your tip of the week? All right, Mark, uh, you know, the, here's the thing is we, we want to give. I mean, Rock just talked about giving, right? And, you know, sometimes you have to, like, think about the, the giving that you, you have in your life, right? Like, I, I got to go and I got to do something. I got to write a check. I got to do something. Sometimes that makes giving hard. But, you know, it's amazing because when you go, like, this morning, I went to McDonald's and they're like, hey, would you like to round up for the Ronald McDonald house? I'm like, yeah, sure, no problem. They made it easy for me, right? Like, they made it easy and it cost me, you know, 85 cents or something. And what's 85 cents? Well, times a lot of people, it's a lot of money. Well, check out this app. It's called, uh, it's called Momentum. Uh, and you can get, get it at givemomentum.com. And what's cool about it is that it's like an IFTTT, an if this, then that type of a scenario. So like you can say like, here, here's how much money I want to give a month. Let's say $150 a month. And then as you go through your day and things happen, well, then all of a sudden it will take the money and it will give it to some charities that you predetermined. So, for example, let's pick on uh, our President Trump. Every time Trump sends a tweet, 10 cents, I'm going to donate it to this foundation. Or every time I go get a cup of coffee, I'm going to round up and give the money to, I don't know, a homeless shelter. 
Uh, every, every time Stephen Curry shoots a three pointer, this charity gets this amount of money. So all of a sudden your life kind of this app basically takes your life and makes the giving automatic. And that's pretty cool. It. That is very I, I, cool. That's really, that's a great tip. Um, I've got a, a interesting book. I think rock would like, um, it is called total freedom and it is Jay Krishnamurti. Um, it's probably not the easiest read, but it's, it, it kind of talks a lot about what Rock talks about. Um, and it, it's, it's, he's just one of those enlightened cats, like a Deepak Chopra. Um, Deepak Chopra, I think, learned a lot from Jay Krishnamurti. And um, just, you know, how much needless suffering we have simply by what's in our heads and um, and then kind of getting to total freedom. Uh, again, I'd like to also recommend learn more, go to rockthomas.com, rockthomas.com. We'll have a link in the show notes. And just a reminder, the only way we're going to get the quality of guests like a Rock Thomas from rockthomas.com is going to do three little things. You've got to subscribe. You've got to rate, you've got to review the podcast. Send us a screenshot of that review to support at thelandgeek.com. We're going to send you for free the $97 Passive Income Launch Kit course, as well as the latest wholetailing course, How to Double Your Money, 30 Days or Less. If you're really ready to get into passive income in the most expedient way possible, climb up that mountain with Scott Todd, have him be your Sherpa, learn more about flight school, at thelandgeek.com forward slash training. Rock Thomas, are we good? We are good. I just like to remind everybody that the words that follow I am follow you. So describe yourself with intention, gifted, guided, grateful, powerful, passionate, playful, whatever words that describe you at your best, and then start to live into that. I love it. I love it. Scott Todd, are we good? We're good, Mark. All right. Here we go. One, two, three. Let let freedom rain. 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 You got it. You got it. All right. Thanks, Rock Thomas. Well, thank you. That was fun. That was great. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Nice, nice, quick questions and straight to the point. Good stuff. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for listening to the Art of Passive Income podcast. Start your journey at www.thelandgeek.com and www.scotttodd.net. Rate and review the podcast and email support at thelandgeek.com. Your screenshot for a free passive income launch kit.